Good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen. This is O.P. Yadav. I'm the CEO of National Heart Institute and the Editor-in-Chief of Indian Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. We are reporting from the sidelines of the second annual conference of the Minimally Invasive Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgeons of India. And it's indeed a great honor for us to have Professor Gino Girosa. Welcome, Gino. Thank you. Professor Girosa is the departmental head of heart transplant and mechanical circulatory devices at the University of Padova in Italy. If I were to ask you, you know, we generalist cardiac surgeons are confused about this concept of pulsatility. So are you a votary of pulsatility in mechanical ventricular assist devices or is it a hype? It's an hype because you know that there is a, an evolution in technology and we move from pulsatile mechanical circulatory support devices to continuous flow devices. Yeah. And this evolution uh, allowed to reduce the size because of course if you are moving from pulsatile device to continuous flow device, you don't need the valve, which guarantee the unidirectionality of the flow through the, through the device itself. So being able to reduce the size and to be able to keep the device inside the pericardial space, of course, this was a major improvement in terms of morbidity and mortality for those patients who need uh, MCS support. But what about the downside, the aortic incompetence, the GI bleeds, aneurysms, all those things, uh, aren't they important? You're absolutely right, because uh, the onset of aortic insufficiency over the long-term period of uh, support yeah. with a continuous flow pump and the GI bleeding are an issue. Of course, now there are some other technological advancements for example, the ability for this continuous flow device to interrupt the continuous flow for a while and have some pulsatility will improve over time the reduction of the onset of aortic insufficiency and the reduction of GI bleeding episodes. So technology is there in order to improve the final results of MCS. So uh, does the indication for a mechanical suppo circulatory support, does that dictate what kind of device you're using means if you are using it for a uh, bridge to transplant or as destination therapy or a bridge to recovery does that uh, define whether you use a continuous flow or a pulsatile flow or that has no effect no really because we are always using continuous flow pump device we are not using uh, pulsatile uh, devices all. so far at all but there is another difference that this relates to the cable connecting the pump itself to the battery and to the control unit. Mm -hmm. And of course, this plays a role because, for example, there is one device, the Jarvik 2000, yeah. who doesn't need the cable coming out from the abdomen of the patient because it's fixed behind the ear on the skull for the patient. And of course, this can avoid torsion, traction, friction of the cable at the exit site and can reduce in an incredible way, the onset of infection Infections. episodes. So there are some other technological advancements, regardless continuous or pulsatile flow that can improve results over time. And what about the transcutaneous transfer of energy? Those techniques are evolving any further? When we were growing up, you know, we were talking so much about solenoid technology and those. Yeah. TET, that means transcutaneous yes. energy transmission yeah. is a key concept and it's crucial and I hope in the next three five years we will be able to have every single device either LVAD or total artificial art because when we are talking about pulsatile device we are talking about the total artificial art yes and we can go back to this uh, topic later on during our discussion So, what are the current results of a total artificial heart and what's the longest survival we have so the longest survival for a patient is actually a patient who has been implanted in Padua and he survived uh, over four years with a total artificial art, with a cardio west, with a syncardia, total syncardia. artificial art. And then he underwent a successful transplant. But this is a good story because this patient, when we transplanted the patient, we successfully transplanted the patient after four years, that was the 
fourth time operation, third time redo. So it was a very high risk patient. And for a while, he decided not to undergo the heart transplant because quality of life with a noiseless uh, pneumatical driven, driven console, you know, was acceptable. Then they switched to the freedom that is smaller. It can allow the patient even to go on a bicycle. We have a little movie of this patient going on a bicycle with a backpack and the freedom uh, drive unit inside the backpack. But the noise was tr is tremendous compared to the previous uh, uh, drive unit. A and the patient at that point decided that he would take the risk of the third time redo to undergo heart transplantation. Because, and this is a key point, one thing is to grant survival of our patient, but immediately after that, you should grant an acceptable quality of life. Quality of life. And here comes all the discussion about the TET technology, about the noiseless technology that can grant quality of life acceptable for the patient, mimicking what you get with the heart transplant, actually, for destination therapy patients. Let me go back a little now. Here was a patient who, in desperate circumstances, chose a transplant because of noise and quality of life. But how do you see comparing, considering that the organs are always in short supply, how is mechanical ventricular support versus transplant as a primary option as destination therapy? How, how do you decide between the two? That you go for a transplant or a mechanical circulatory arrest? This is a crucial point, and I'm telling you why. Because you decided at the beginning that the patient can be a, a suitable uh, candidates for a uh, uh, bridge to transplant. Yeah. So you're implanting the LVAD just to bridge your patient and waiting for the proper organ to arrive. Yes, yes. Then the patient, quality of life with the LVAD is better because they are noiseless, because they are electrically powered. And so the patient uh, uh, say, okay, I can stay like this. And then he can uh, move from the uh, queue of the bridge to transplant to the destination therapy. Yeah. But suddenly, you have patients that have been implanted as a destination therapy uh, strategy. And then you have an infection, you have a pump thrombosis, you have uh, some uh, stroke. And then you want to move the patient to the transplant list. So there is this interchange. The patient makes things more difficult, also from an ethical point of view. But you have to take care of the patient at the end of the story. Yeah, but if... if, if I'm not talking of the second group when yep. because of circumstances, a pump thrombosis or infection, you move to transplant. I mean, if there is no transplant option available, for example, Japan has a big problem, uh, religious problem, yep, sure. that religion does not allow organ donation because the person who donates organ, he will not get salvation. We in India also have certain religious uh, taboos. which we, So organ is always in short supply. So how do mechanical ventricular assist compare as primary destination therapy compared to heart transplant? Is it too inferior? Is it equivalent or is it superior? Good question. So some patients are addressed to destination therapy directly yes. because they have some contraindication to okay. transplant and this makes your life easier, you know, yeah. because the decision is No contraindication. Easier. Both but options both, available. Both option, options are available. Now, if you look at survival yeah. after the first two years yeah. and we compare MCS, LVAD survival yes. to heart transplant, we are, as Jim, Jim Kirkling said and stated in the paper, we are on track to compete with heart transplantation. Okay. When we move from the two-year survival to the five-year survival, that's a different story. That's a different story. And that is a different story because at the beginning we all thought that the patient were not going to come back to the hospital once you have implanted an LVAD. But that's not the truth because yes. the patient is coming back not only because of GI bleeding or problem like that or infection, things like that, but because of the right ventricular dysfunction. So you can implant the LVAD and the right ventricle is still doing well, but this is a, a caveat that I, I would address to our cardiologist colleague. They were used to follow up the patient till the point that the patient should undergo heart transplant. So they were not taking care of the right ventricle because at the end of the story, biventricular dysfunction would be replaced by the heart transplant. Now with the LVAD, we should refer the patient and timing becomes crucial. Referral timing, you know, it becomes crucial because you should uh, implant the LVAD 
when the right ventricle is still working well. Yes. If not, you're going to have uh, some serious problem in the immediate post-op period. But also, you can have the only chance to implant a total artificial heart. That means to replace both ventricles with a pulsatile device that is very effective in terms of cardiac output, but is not that effective in terms of granting quality of life. So moving forwards, do you see these numbers that we have increasing or going down as we are controlling the risk factors, you know, public education, reduced salt intake, less heart failure? In, 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 uh, I mean, I can recall my training days when we used to so many uh, dyskinetic segments and aneurysms. Those numbers are coming down now. We don't see as many LV aneurysms as I used to do, say, 10 years or 20 years back. So do you think the numbers would come down or do you think they're going to increase? Now, we should be really careful look at the uh, cohort of patients because a lot of patients, they are uh, facing heart failure, but at a very advanced age, over the age of 75. So elderly patients with heart failure, they are not candidate for MCS. You're talking of systolic heart failure or diastolic heart failure? At this moment, I'm talking about systolic heart failure, but we shouldn't yeah. forget diastolic heart failure as well. Yeah. And also, more important is the fact that referral is increasing because now patients and cardiologists, they, are, uh, they, they feel more confident to refer patients for MCS implantation compared to a couple of years ago. So numbers are still growing. But again, there are some drugs coming on the, on the, yeah. on the market now, and those will play a, 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 an incredible role in the very near future. And what are the new technologies which are exciting and are, you, you foresee them to be disruptive in the near foreseeable future? Experimental technologies, can you... I, I Is there any biological ventricle... Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, I was thinking about that because yeah. uh, one thing that we are working on that in Padua is the ability to decelerize the whole heart. For example, a pig heart, you know, Doris Taylor have done that with a rat heart. And of course, she was able to recreate the, uh, the electrical pathways and to recreate some uh, electromechanical coupling, but just providing, uh, uh, let's say, single digit of pressure that is not enough to grant uh, survival for a human being. But uh, upscaling, the, 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 the upscaling the model, going using, for example, uh, a human heart or even a bigger heart, you can decelerize the whole heart, you yeah. can leave the, 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 the scaffold of collagen and elastin, and then recreate the, the environment, the proper environment to see the uh, cells, for example, IPS from the potential recipient, yeah. and then recreate the cardiomyocyte and the endothelial cell, the smooth muscle cells. We are working on that, as I said, as I mentioned before in Padua, and this is extremely fascinating and uh, exciting. So you think cell-based therapies are kind of the future? There are a lot of uh, uh, piece of the puzzle that are still missing, but I think that there is some, uh, some potentiality there. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, you just heard Professor Giroza giving his thoughts on mechanical support, circulatory support, its problems, the future, and he strongly believes that at this moment, probably heart transplant in time frame more than two years is a better option, but ventricular support systems are evolving, transcutaneous allergy transfers, as well as the continuous flow pumps are the future. They are reduced the size of implantation. They have reduced complication rates. And the quality of life is better with them. With those, Professor Jiroza, thanks a lot for being with us. And I appreciate your coming and spending you. time with us. Thank you. Thank you.